with more than 92,000 inmates and a dramatic drop in staff numbers, UK prisons are stretched to the limit. Across this series, footage shot on illegally smuggled mobile phones illustrate ex-prisoners' unvarnished accounts of brutality. People being pulled into a prison cell and, you know, tortured for lengths of time before somebody's come to rescue them. The lengths inmates go to for drugs. There's guys that will take a full blood punch in the face for spice. Smuggling contraband. Believe it or not, people plug multiple mobile phones up their ass. And even claims that some wardens are part of the problem. It's like a little system inside the system in the jail where the screws are sort of in on it. Former officers lift the lid on the difficulties they face with overcrowding. Prisons are always full. We don't have the luxury of a suite of empty cells. Misconduct. You do have corrupt staff, which is sadly not a nice thing to stay, say, but they do exist. And trauma. You get used to violence, you get used to blood and gore, you get used to seeing death. In 2017, around 15,000 illegal phones and SIM cards were confiscated in prisons across the country. The equivalent of one for every six inmates. With so many mobiles illegally smuggled inside, it's no surprise that prisoners have begun to upload their own view of life behind bars for everyone to see. An overstretched prison workforce means incidents like this violent and destructive spree have surfaced online for the public to witness. And shocking footage of prisoners blatantly flouting the rules make for extremely uncomfortable viewing. For first-time offenders, it's a baptism of fire. My thoughts on prison before I even went uh, were Shawshank Redemption. Of American shows, The Wire, you know, things like that, uh, where I'd, I'd imagine it to be really tough, loads of guys all in one group, new fish coming in, that type of thing. And there were, there were elements of that that were true, um, but for the most part, it was totally different than I imagined. I used to drive past the prisons I live near. I used to drive past worm and scrubs all the time, look at this. Sometimes I just, before I went to prison, I used to just stop the car and look outside and just think, like, sometimes you all do bad things in life, but I never, I'd thought I'd never end up in that place, never end up in that place. A year and a half later, I was behind them walls. You're walking through this main strip, all these new guys coming into prison. You know, we just got off a sweat box, so everyone's really nervous. Um, and we walked, we were walking down, and all these guys shouting different things, people shouting things from windows. So it was a little intimidating. The people get targeted, especially the new prisoners. They know when you've just come onto the wing, they see you coming on with your big bag and they're looking at what you've got in your clear. It's a clear bag, it's a big clear bag and all your stuff's in there. They give you a bag with your prison issues, your uniform, your shorts, your blue plate, a little plastic knife and fork, what you get. It's not just the other prisoners that new inmates have to worry about. Once inside, they have plenty of time to contemplate the consequences of their actions and their fears for the future. It's a sense of not having anyone around you, there's just a door locked. You, you can't even imagine it, because I say to people all the time, you know, try and imagine yourself locked in a room for a week, how would that make you feel? My biggest fear, really, wasn't myself. It was everybody else that was outside of prison, that was being left behind. You know, the forgotten victims are the friends and the families that are left behind that obviously often didn't play a part in the crime, but still have to sort of deal with the emotional journey that it takes you on. So for me, I guess it was wondering how life on the outside was going to cope without me there. So it's like being dehumanised, like that was the worst thing for me. Racism was the worst thing for me discrimination and taking away my name and giving me a number, putting me in a cage in the first place, that was the worst thing for me. The first few weeks were really dark. Um, there's a lot going on in prisoners' minds. So I hadn't been sentenced at this point, I was on remand. So you're thinking about how long am I going to lose of my life here, thinking over what have I just done with my life. 
it's hard to imagine the true reality of life on the inside. But a surge in available mobile phones has made it possible to get a shocking glimpse of the volatile and confrontational nature of prison life from day one. This vicious blow with a snooker ball in a sock is a powerful display of someone attempting to assert their dominance. And it sparks a ferocious battle. I went to jail that first night and um, I'm not going to lie to you. And anyone who says that they don't will be lying to you. My first night in a prison cell, I cried my heart out to, to, to myself, really. Aggression and antagonism in jail manifests itself in displays like this fearsome punch-up. And the tension is palpable. When there's unrest, you can feel it. You can feel a tension. I mean, you, I mean, you can feel that on the wing anyway. If something's going to happen, things it's, it's it's hard to explain, but you pick up on it. Um, you feel it. Here's an unnerving and fierce example of the type of violent inmates who rule the cells. Their brutal scrap is shocking and unsettling. And as inmates are well aware, they have no control of who might come into their cell. Is that it? The scariest thing in jail is probably when you first come on the wing and you're behind your door and you don't know who's who. You don't know who's on the other side. You're unpacking and people are coming to you and they're getting to try and know you. And if you're a smoker, do you want a cigarette? Do you know what I mean? And, and they, they try and, they, if they see that little bit of weakness, that's it then, they're exploiting that weakness. And that becomes a game to people in there. Anti-gang campaigner Chris Preddy, OBE, works with prisoners and knows all too well how new inmates can be targeted. I met one guy, I won't relate his name like that, but he was a very, very key member in prison and he told me himself that he runs the prison. When you come into prison, you've got to speak to him. And when you speak to him, he will friend you up, he will give you a cigarette, he will give you pop noodles and stuff like that. And you'd be sitting there thinking, all right, Chris, there's only pop noodles and a cigarette. But for you to get initiated like that, he, he, he kind of like befriends you. And then he says the next day, he comes to your cell, he grabs you by the throat and says, right, you owe me money for that cigarette and that pop noodles. And it's as fast as that. I was thinking to myself, should I come out of my cell or should I not come out of my cell? And I felt like, you know what, if I don't come out of my cell, people are going to think that I'm a little boy or something or scared. But if I come out of my cell, I ain't coming out to play. I'm coming out to fight. And I chose to come out myself. And that's what I did. That's what I did throughout my sentence. I just fight. I'd fight whoever's there. I'd fight anyone. Anyone that's coming. Even the govs. Tensions run high in UK prisons. And with biting staff shortages and severe overcrowding, life on the inside for both inmates and staff is increasingly pressured. Since 1900, the prison population of England and Wales alone has quadrupled in size. Around half of that increase taking place since 1990. Not very nice. But it's alright, it's got to clean their equipment and that. This crudely um, shot footage gives a taste of life in the cells. Alright, let's go to another cell and see what it's like. I'm just going to come and shut the door. We've got some art on the wall. Yeah, the cramped and messy space. conditions are plain to see. That's a floor. You can see a little bit of floor in there. And it's a startling record of the standard of prison living. Look at that nice clean seat. Fifty-eight percent of UK prisons are overcrowded, with inmates spending the majority of their time in close quarters. Once inside, they get a real sense of how confined their lives will be. In your bog standard two-person setup, you'll have your metal bunk bed with a little table and a chair, your toilet very close to your bed, um, a little flat pack, like here, wardrobe, um, with your TV stood on the top of it. 
and that's basically it, a notice board on the wall to pin up any pictures or calendars. Some cells had en-suites, so some would have a toilet with a door, which was a bit easier. Some would just have a toilet down the end at the bottom of the bed with a curtain. You used to have a table, two drawers, one for you, one for your cellmate. If you're good, you'll have a TV in there. <laughs> and then in the same room, so in exactly the same setup, in the left-hand corner, there's a toilet, just an open toilet there. So that, that was the main thing I had to adjust to when I went inside, was you shit in front of other people. A loss of privacy is not the only problem in the cells. Longer sentences, budget cuts and overcrowding have led to dire conditions. The cells are all the same really, they get cleaned out, but as soon as you go in there you can feel that this cell, like, this cell is not nice. Like, there's sometimes, like, they don't care what happens in cells. Many things happen in cells, someone could slit their arm and just be blood all over the cell. All they'll get someone to do is just, they'll get a prisoner to put on the overalls, pay them about 25 quid give them all the equipment, uh, um, bleaches and all that, clean up the cell, do it in about 25 minutes. Lack of cleanliness has other unpleasant implications. Using a novel approach to pest control, this inmate performs a revolting and stomach-churning stunt. People were moaning, saying, God, there's cockroaches in my cell and there's rats and that, but what do you expect? Not everyone in the prison is going to be clean as yourself or whatnot, and these creatures attract dirt. So if you're not cleaning up your cell and that, then what do you expect? And once they come, they just come, there's loads of them, and you can't really, especially if he's on the bottom floor, it was, it was rats, cockroaches, but if he's on the top floor, like on the third floor, it was a bit rare, really. Sharing a small space for up to 23 hours a day and eating food in close proximity to the toilet brings with it a whole new set of problems and, in some cases, conflict. Fights um, kick off in prison for a number of reasons, just as they do on the outside world. They go through... The situation or the atmosphere will go from zero to 100. Um, real quick in a prison because the general um, environment is one of a lot of stress and pressure and frustration. If there's lack of purposeful activity or somebody's not had a visit that they was expecting or the phone's gone dead when speaking to a loved one, you know, it really has an impact on somebody a lot worse than what it would if you're on the outside world because you can't just pick the phone up again in another 10 minutes time or jump in the car to go and see that person. So it does create um, quite a, a tense, vulnerable atmosphere, which of course, you know, fights can arise from. So you'll find people are fighting over things that they wouldn't ordinarily on the outside. The first guy that I got as a cellmate was um, the type of guy that you really don't want to get. <laughs> He was about 21. He was previously on cocaine. He'd done a lot of steroids. He was incredibly unstable. He'd been out of prison for two weeks, committed another huge offence. Um, after like a five-year sentence, something like that, he was back inside and very, very aggressive. So I wasn't happy about him. And there was a couple like, you know, conflicts and run-ins with him. But eventually I found kind of methods to deal with him. For former drug dealer turned anti-gang campaigner Sefton Henry, the only way to cope was to become the aggressor. I wouldn't share my hell with anyone, I'd smack him up. But I remember one time in Brixton prison, the guy had tried to step on my bed with his foot. <laughs> my man had no socks on, was he mad? <laughs> I smacked him up. I smacked him up, you can't step on my bed like that. And then he's run to the like, the buzzer to call the govs. I said, you're telling the govs you're leaving today. <laughs> and that's what he did. The next guy tried to smoke. When well, these times I weren't smoking. How are you gonna be smoking in a cell and I'm, I'm not smoking? I just hotted him up. I didn't even have to beat him up. This guy was just scared. 
And then he rang the bell and then they got him out. And obviously, when you keep smacking people up, they start to realise, hey, I can't be putting people in your cell. So you get those guys, no objectives in life. They just want to physically dominate the immediate moment. They have no plans going to the future. It's just about immediate domination, really. And I'd say that's quite typical. Lots of bravado. I wanted to be that kind of person. I wanted to be a good person. But somehow, I'm always reacting in violence. I'm always fighting. I'm always trying to defend myself. It's tiring. Many cellmates just fight. Many just sit down and just go for it. Or many just say, you know what, yeah, just go talk to an officer and say, listen, this is going to... I don't get on with this person. And if you don't move me, this is going to happen. So you've got to move me now. Nine times out of ten, they'll say, we're not moving you. And then you'll just say to the officer, all right, you're not moving me, watch what happens. And then that's it. So occasionally it did come down to just physical intimidation and sort of dominance struggles. And at those situations, you really just got to hold your own. And considering I'd gone into prison, it was my first offence, and I thought I'd messed up my whole life. I really felt like I had nothing to lose at some of those moments. So when big guys were challenging me, I'd say, OK, let's go. Because I just, I didn't really have anything to cling to at that point in my life. Going into prison with a reputation where you're the youngest kid in the UK to get an ASBO, you're known for criminal activity, and you're all over the, you're all, you're everywhere, all over the UK, so people know who you are. So when I'm going into jail with that reputation, there are people in there who say to me, right, I recognise you, come on, let's have a fight. You know, I think on the outside world, you've got the fortune of being able to gauge somebody um, a little bit better in their day-to-day -day life, whereas in a prison cell, people can tell you pretty much anything. And, you know, you've only really got their word to go on until you're able to talk to other people and sort of access the truth and find out who they are as an individual, what they're about, what their demeanour is. There are a lot of very conflict-based people that want to challenge you. They're all very disagreeable. That's, in fact, the, the best way to describe them. So if you say something they don't like, they'll tell you immediately, or they'll call you out on it and insult you. But there was also a lot of humour going on all the time, and there was a slight element of camaraderie amongst everyone, because you are all in the same boat, ultimately. Despite the camaraderie, shocking and ferocious escalations of violence break out, challenging the overloaded and sometimes inexperienced staff. With the number of prison staff dropping from 25,000 to just 18,000 since 2010, it's no surprise that staggering footage like this emerges, clearly demonstrating what happens when wardens are desperately outnumbered by inmates. It's a fairly relatively well-known fact that unlocking doors on prisons in the morning can be the time where you can be sort of at risk. Prisoners have been in their cells all night. We have no idea what's gone on. Have they slept badly? Have they had problems with their cellmate? Uh, some prisoners come out and they have all these thoughts going through their minds. They've got issues and problems of their own to manage. Uh, we're unlocking doors and they're coming out of those cells. So it's about being aware. Alarming images of violent assault like these captured on CCTV reveal just how powerless officers are when they are so heavily outnumbered. Once the doors are unlocked, cells can become an aggression-filled free-for-all. The worst that I've heard of, blimey, um, well, all number of things have been done in prison cells, especially since there's been a lack of, of staff, you know, there's, there, there's rumours, if you like, if you want to call them that, of people being pulled into a prison cell and, you know, tortured for lengths of time before somebody's come to rescue them. You're not watching everything at the same time. That's virtually impossible. But prisoners are watching you. They know where you are on the landings and at what part of the landing you're on at any one time. You may be dealing with an issue with a prisoner. There may be something going on with a prisoner in the cell that one of you have got to attend that and manage that situation. So you might be left with two officers on the wing who are answering bells, trying to sort issues out. Um, obviously, from their landing, they can't do everything from everybody else's landing. And they're also taking prisoners down to reception, maybe go to court. Uh, just the phone going constantly, bells going. It was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. Because you're just, you're not given that time, you haven't, you, you haven't got those staff. 
they come around and check on you. There's little hatches or windows on the doors, and they'll send screws, you know, periodically to check on you. But I remember working out at one point, like the biggest time between the last check to the next check was about five hours. If your cellmate was really aggressive, he could do things to you then, you could do nothing. You know, there's panic buttons and stuff like that, but ultimately you were by yourself for that time and you had to defend yourself in that cell or, you know, uh, put things in place to defend yourself. Anything can be used as a weapon, even down to the plastic cutlery that's issued, you know, to replace the metal cutlery to stop it being used as a weapon. We give them things to clean with. We, we give them things to play games with. You cannot avoid weapons in prisons. We give them mops, we give them buckets, we give them chemicals in order to uh, obviously keep, keep wings and, and communal areas um, clean. <clears throat> we give them snooker balls, we give them darts, we give them pool and snooker cues, they're all weapons. They did well to control a lot of the situations, you know, they had protocols in place, to, you know, panic buttons and things like that. But I could see the risk at lots of different moments. So those social times when all of the prisoners are all out at once, they'd sometimes have a few more guys on, um, but it, I think it was, si I'd say six maximum, six prisoners to a, sorry, six prison officers to a hundred prisoners was about the maximum that I saw. And then when I went to a Cat C prison, it got less. So there was periods of the day where I didn't see any prison officers for hours, which is slightly disturbing as a prisoner because I, Ultimately, they were there to protect you. Left alone without supervision for hours on end, violence, both spontaneous and carefully organized, becomes commonplace. Go! Oh. Stay in, stay in, stay in! Savage scraps like these take place in front of an eager and excited audience. With no outside interference. And staff are nowhere to be seen as these inmates engage in a furiously fought bare knuckle boxing match. During these videos of, of fighting and stuff, you know, you can see in the video behind us that, you know, there's three, four, five people fighting in one room. And where are the, where are the prison staff? It, it comes back to the, the support again. And, you know, there's not enough staff to, to accommodate the prison. And quite clearly from that video, it does show that the prisoners are running the prison and there is no structure and there is no support. When there's no structure and no support, prisoners make up their own rules. The results make for uncomfortable viewing. You could have several prisoners in a cell, two of which are naked on all fours with some form of a leash around their necks. A little bit like what you see with pit bull fighting. The average length of custodial sentences in UK prisons has gradually increased in recent years, and inmates have more time on their hands than ever before. When it comes to entertaining themselves, events can take a humiliating and degrading turn as this unsettling footage of a prison dogfight shows in graphic detail. Dogfighting. Well, what you have there, again, sadly, is a number of prisoners in a cell, as probably as many as they can actually physically get in there without it drawing attention to themselves. Unfortunately, you don't have the, the staff on the ground to monitor this anymore. So you could have several prisoners in a cell, two of which are naked on all fours with some form of a leash around their necks. A little bit like what you see with pit bull fighting. <laughs> Alarming and disturbing footage like this has emerged online and is terrifying in its ferocity. It's purely down to entertainment. When these people are locked up now for 23 hours a day, they probably have an hour to themselves to do the things that they need to do, whether that's to get some washing done in the laundry, to make phone calls to uh, friends and family. There's only so much they can actually do in, the, in their own time. And they get bored. And it's just another way of uh, exercising some form of power 
some form of humiliation. I actually, in Maidstone Prison, walking along the landing and a bit like the shower cubicles are open and you just walk past them. And you've got the doors are sort of half doors that leave a gap underneath and a gap at the top. But there was four feet in this one, both pointing the same way. Weird, in we go. And this guy had got an old prisoner, an old man on all fours, uh, having sex with him. And he'd got a picture of uh, a pornographic magazine on this old guy's back. Why do prisoners do things to other prisoners and stuff like that and, and humiliate them and do games with them? Once again, that will boil down to shortage of staff. There just isn't the staff to supervise, um, to, to make sure the regimes are running safely. With an uneven inmate to officer ratio, it may not be surprising that some members of the prison population will bear the brunt of the violence. Unfortunately, people do get bullied in prison, as the same way as people get bullied out in society. What mirrors society mirrors prison life. I have seen the other side of jail where, you know, my pad mate's getting terrorised because um, he couldn't even speak a word of English. And trying to, he only wanted to know basically where, you know, he wanted to let his family know where he was and whatever else and all this stuff and no one can understand him. So he's left there to rot. There's really, really horrific stories that I hear about inmates going in there and trying to just do their sentence. Some of them are just trying to do their sentence, but when you go into a certain particular place where you've got to remember, everyone in there has some sort of chip on their shoulder. Everyone in there is angry. Everyone in there doesn't want to come or overcome their ego. So everyone wants to be the big old big man and the big old bad man, and that's where the conflicts clash. The idea is that you give help and support to somebody that's being bullied. And we do have a, a paperwork exercise in terms of whether you have somebody that is the victim of bullying or whether you have somebody who is the perpetrator of bullying. Both of those people are obviously spoken to, yes, under separate circumstances. Um, and if it's somebody that is the victim of bullying, then you offer as much help and support as you, you can offer that person. The people or the person that's doing the bullying, then you certainly let them know that they're being watched. Being gay, it's quite easy to get exploited and to put yourself in a situation where people are coming into your pad and there's four or five lads who are sexually frustrated and there's nothing you can do because one of them's standing covering the buzzer, there's a piece of paper up your windows, the screws can't come in, what's going on inside that pad? You've got half an hour to an hour before the, the squad and everyone comes, what's going on in that pad? You don't know, everyone's chilling there, happy as Larry when the right squad and that comes, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, ready, go, go, so, so. Staggering scenes of merciless ready? violence paint an upsetting picture of prison life. And it's little wonder that many inmates turn to drugs as a means of distraction. Drugs in prison is escapism. Why do they need to escape? If there was purposeful activity, drugs would be a lot less. Drugs were insanely common and accessible inside. It was easier to get drugs inside than it is outside of prison. I was literally 10 feet away from any dealer at any given time in prison, and you could get anything you wanted. The only difference was that Everything was four times the price as normal, so they make a lot more money in prison. Oh, blimey. Um, so the drugs that are available in prison is everything that's available outside in the streets, really. Everything from um, cannabis, cocaine, heroin, MDMA, spice is obviously now a controlled substance. At one point it was illegal. Um, anything and everything. But it caused people to go absolutely insane. They'd have these flights of fantasy and moments of total delusion where it looked like they were hallucinating um, and they were totally out of it. So that was the scariest drug that I saw inside. Using a makeshift pipe and with the encouragement of cellmates, it's deeply unsettling to see just how powerful spice or Mamba really is. In a short space of time, the smoker is visibly rendered unresponsive, much to everyone's amusement. And eventually he is completely and utterly sparked out, though no one appears particularly concerned. Whenever I've seen someone on that spy stuff, they don't, they, they look a bit mad, like they don't know what they're doing. 
like obviously when someone's taking pills, I've seen people take pills in jail and that, um, ecstasy tablets, but they're calm. Like even though they are high, high and they're doing a bit of a madness, but they're still half in control of themselves. When I see them on the spice now, they look like they're not in control at all. So that's the scary part of that. On my first night in jail, um, I did ask myself the question of how easy drugs would be um, to get in there. And what I did find is, I thought, yeah, it'll be weed, you know, everyone's going to be smoking weed. That's not the case. It's actually mamba, that spice shit, black mamba and whatever else they put in there. And um, what people do in there as well, it is well known, people will offer you a cigarette and they'll say to you, OK, have a cigarette, you know, and you're smoking that cigarette and then all of a sudden you're feeling a bit funny. Or what's in there? It's it's not weed. It's not it's it's mamba that you're smoking, and I've seen it. People fitting, people you know falling downstairs, and even the prison officers say to themselves, say themselves, mamba in here is a nightmare. People you smell it on the landings. The the prison smell. I would explain a prison se se um, smell as mamba as as spice. It stinks like it in there. <laughs> Increases in spice use have led to shocking videos appearing online and bluntly demonstrating the zombie-like effects of the drug. I've seen that, you know, numerous times where people have took too much drugs. I'd be pretty sure he'd taken spice to get like that, you know, his eyes were open wide. Um, red roar and he was just totally out of it wasn't he? he he didn't know what he was doing I think the saddest thing about that clip is that's probably somebody's dad or brother or son um, and whilst he's out his head and he can't see himself in that state his friends and family could if they see that clip I wonder what his view would be if he watched that clip back of himself I've seen the odd uh, video on social media. I mean, it's become so uh, prevalent now that it just, it's just like, oh, another one. You know, it's, uh, I, it, sometimes in actual fact, I don't want to watch them because they make me upset. You don't want to do another one of them pipes, do you? This alarmingly vacant spice user shows in excruciating detail how drugs provide entertainment for fellow inmates. <laughs> So we might have a pot. Give him another lick. Give... His state of intoxication is an astonishing insight into just how powerful spice is and how it has become a commonplace means of entertainment on the inside. You can't take no more. Put the camera down. Put the camera down. Huh? Don't. It's like people encourage you almost, like, come on, it's what everybody else does and it's all this, you know, they're getting all buzzed up. But what people don't realise is most of them people who are getting you to take them drugs, you know, they've got phones out and they're videoing you, and they're putting it on YouTube, they're putting it on, on your Facebook or uh, social media, they're putting it everywhere and, you, and you're just getting targeted. And they look for people who are vulnerable, who they think, yeah, he, he'll be all right, he'll want a faggot, he will, he's the new kid, let's go and give him some mamba, let's go and sit in his pad. The next thing you know, you're waking up, you don't know what's happened, you've got black eyes, you know, d d what's happened, you don't know, do you? you know? And, and these things do happen day in and day out, and it is quite serious, because I've seen it myself. Yeah, got him, don't worry, that's no, a light one, that's a light one, that's a light one, bro. Come on, she Explicit in its portrayal of just what spice can do to a user in a short space of time, this smoker is about to become completely helpless. No, but that's, that's not power enough, is it? You want a bit of the VDs, don't you? Oh, shit. The extreme and disturbing effects are shown in graphic detail. He's gone, he's gone, he's gone, leave it, leave it. and the extent to which it is used to amuse and entertain other inmates is frighteningly apparent. As a bit of a throwaway line in a joke, we often used to say to prisoners, can't you guys go back to smoking cannabis? It was a damn sight easier. Um, we do, unfortunately, turn 
some prisoners into drug addicts simply because a substance like cannabis or THC if you smoke it often enough will be in your system for a minimum of two to three weeks possibly a month whereas opiate based drugs such as heroin would only be in your system for a small amount of time a few days up to a week at best so certainly with the prevalence of spice or NPS this is causing uh, massive problems around the prison estates I've witnessed and, and been involved in incidents where several burly large ex, ex and present rugby playing staff have literally been thrown around like a rag doll. With the new psychoactive uh, substances, I mean, that's just completely game changer. Um, the sights that I saw of people, it was horrendous. You know, and you have some prisoners who are spiking other prisoners um, and finding it hilarious when they um, go, go, you know, do things unpredictable. It's an awful, some of these drugs, spice, etc., are awful. The state that, well, people die. People have died of them and will still die because it's not being tackled enough. We've seen the staggering surge in the use of spice in prison. The methods employed to smuggle it in are both inventive and surprising. There's many ways that drugs are brought into prisons, from the old movie stuff of people smuggling it in on visits, to people bringing it in themselves when they're admitted to prison, to chucking it over the wall, um, right down to the probably more common ways, and that's corruption amongst staff, bringing them in themselves. So far, we've heard shocking testimony about life on the inside from prisoners and prison officers. And seen explosive footage filmed by inmates on smuggled mobile phones. So what exactly does get smuggled into jail? And how does it get there? This is our living. This astonishing footage gives a clear demonstration of what inmates can plug. Yes, that's right. Plugging is the method of concealing contraband where the sun don't yeah. shine. God loves a hustler. People, believe it or not, people plug multiple mobile phones up their ass and then come into prison. Three phones and a charger, I've heard before. That's quite a lot of space. <laughs> These inmates are blatant about showing off an incredible amount of stash, worth a considerable amount of money within the inflated prison economy. If you've got cash, cash is like triple. So if you've got £20, it could probably be like £100 in prison. So people smuggle these phones in. They're incredibly valuable. £400, £500. I've seen £1,000 for like an old, crappy, uh, like Nokia style phone. So they go for huge amounts of money inside. What about know about living like this in jail, boy? Calls have been made to ban the sale of miniature mobile phones like these. Simple to smuggle, they make it easy to obtain contraband like tobacco and drugs from outside the prison walls. Yeah, there's a lot of drugs in prisons and it's not a secret. I think everybody that's been to prison would say exactly the same thing. It's really easy to get drugs inside. They'll just throw it over the wall. Um, in other prisons, you'll have a visit and the girl she would plug it or whatever she'd put it down her skirt wherever she's putting it and then she'll pass it through the visit sometimes she'll have it in her mouth there's also people coming from other prisons because it's rare for prisoners to search a prisoner on the way out of prison why would you they're getting rid of them so they could have anything on them and they could transport it to another prison reasonably easily there's also the classic uh, method of trying to catapult over a package over the fences and land it into the yard when there's people there, kind of coordinate with uh, prisoners. So you say, oh, what time are you going into the yard? Two o'clock, all right, at 2.15, I'll shoot one over. And then you try and get it. Man, them are always coming in with stuff. Like, I'll just sit there in the, in the, um, the waiting room, and man, I'm like, yeah, 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 I've got, I've got something, you know, I've got this, I've got that. 
And I'm like, oh, OK, cool, calm. The phones, you name it, it's coming through. Everything's coming through. Like, it's very, very easy. Startling images of this man getting a package over the wall in plain view of the public and CCTV cameras clearly reveals one of the common methods of getting contraband into prisons. But it's not the most high-tech way. They've started using drones to fly them over the top of prisons and dropping packages in. So I think they're trying to make prisons a no-fly zone above it now, of a certain degree. You've recently got the phenomenon of uh, drones being transported to uh, prison, prison windows, to prison cells. Due to the lightweight nature of some of these drugs, it's quite easily to transport a good few pounds worth of, in weight of illegal substances in some form of a carrier bag, suspended beneath a drone and literally flown straight to the window. This new method is clearly demonstrated with an outrageous and audacious drone delivery direct to a prison window. However, not every transfer is made in plain sight. One time you'll be in bed and you'll see like um, these red and green lights in the sky. You know, the drones are coming over, coming up to your window, people are getting parcels. The material here isn't particularly clear, but it gives an unambiguous indication of how the cover of darkness can be utilised to a smuggler's advantage. However, this isn't the most surprising means of getting banned items into jail. Could it just be a smokescreen for something much shadier? At the minute, the public statement to how things are getting into prisons is, well, they're flying it over the wall on these drones. So if the drones are removed completely and the stuff's still going on in prisons, you have to look a little bit closer to home, to corruption within staff. I've actually seen prison officers as well handing Mamba to... Um, they, they put it in little tissues and they pretend to be giving the prisoners tissues and they'll pass it on to the other side of the wings and that, and they'll pass the Mamba on to each other. And I've seen it, it's like a little system inside a system in the jail where the screws are sort of in on it. Sadly, you do have, like in a lot of occupations, you do have corrupt staff, which is <clears throat> sadly not a nice thing to stay, say, but they do exist. So that's one way that contraband gets into prisons. I was hearing these stories of uh, corruption and everybody was banging on about it. I thought, no, you know, they're exaggerating. No, they're not. It's, it seems to be going through the roof. Uh, you know, this is a job that, it, it, you know, I actually believe, in all honesty, because of the state of the service and because uh, uh, criminals know how much money can be made in jails with drugs and mobile phones, I actually believe that, that, that people are being recruited to join those prison officers um, to be corrupt. Disquieting stories like these are far from uncommon and paint a depressing picture of the situation in UK prisons today. In our next episode, we'll see more illegally shot footage and hear powerful testimony about life on the inside. There's this thing that happens inside where people go under, they call it. And that's where you kind of, you don't accept the reality of your situation. You try and kind of sleep off your sentence. I don't think there'll be a prison officer about that will not see death one, two, three, four times in their career. It's unfortunate, it's just one of those things that happens. Is there something else I could have done? Could I have done something else? Could I have saved his life?